He had done he had he had done everything he could in the United States and outside of the Philippines. He had uh, rallied the opposition. He had spoken against Marcos. He had testified before Congress, um, and there was nothing more he could do. So he felt that it was it was he really had to go home. Yeah, I told Ninoy, I really honestly feel Ninoy that uh, when you alight from the plane, you will be shot. And there was a moment of silence, and then Ninoy looks at me, and he says, even if I were placed in a box, I would still go home because the Filipinos are worth dying for. I told him, Ninoy, you suffered for seven years and seven months in prison, and I think you've suffered enough for your country. Why should you suffer more? I wrote Mr. Marcos and I told him that while I have vowed never to enter the political arena again, I shall dedicate the last drop of my blood to the restoration of freedom and the dismantlement of your martial law. Do not forget that your readiness to suffer will light the torch of freedom which can never be put out. And learn to say no, no to tyranny, no to corruption, no to all this degradation of human dignity. The moment you say no, you're beginning to protest. The moment you say no to tyranny, you're beginning the struggle, the long, lonely road to freedom. Writer Nick Joaquin organized Aquino's family history around three generations of people who defied authority. Ninoy's grandfather, Sevillano Aquino, fought the colonial power Spain and its successor, the United States of America. Sevillano was a rebel, a national hero, and for a time, a political prisoner. In Aquino's hometown in Tarlac province, it was grandfather Sevillano Aquino who erected a statue to the Philippine national hero, Jose Rizal, who was executed by the Spanish for his opposition to their tyranny. Rizal looks out on a town square that is named for Sevillano's most acclaimed son, Ninoy's father, Don Benigno Aquino Sr., an ardent nationalist. During America's colonial rule of the Philippines, when other politicians clung to the idea of a second-class affiliation with the United States, Benigno Sr. campaigned vigorously for total independence. When Japan completed its invasion of the Philippines in 1942, Benigno Sr., under pressure to soften the blow of invasion, was taken in by Japan's promise of an Asia for Asians. As the fortunes of Japan's military suffered, so did Benigno Aquino's reputation. He was imprisoned by the victorious Americans, then paroled to await trial on charges of collaborating with the enemy. In the company of his namesake, Benigno Jr., he suffered a heart attack. Ninoy told Nick Joaquin, when the Americans came back, Papa was all of a sudden a collaborator. Those who I thought were my friends began to shun me. When he died, I thought my world had ended. I began to distinguish between night and day sorrow and laughter. Determined to recoup the family's name, Aquino started to work on the Manila Times at 15 as a copy boy. He ate, slept, and showered at the newspaper, and at odd hours, he became a copy writer. Uh, I think he started as a messenger boy, and uh, they asked for volunteers of 
reporters to go to Korea and nobody volunteered, so he volunteered. He was uh, 17 years old. He took his own photographs and became known in the press corps as Aquino, the milk boy. He said Korea aged him 10 or 20 years. It gave me the fatalism that's with me to this day. Do your job and hope tomorrow will be another day. And if tomorrow doesn't come, that's it. Returning to the Philippines, Ninoy Aquino struck out into the mountains to interview the most renowned peasant rebel of the island of Luzon, Luis Taruk. Through a series of meetings, Aquino became the conduit for Taruk's surrender, a national event that made Aquino a national figure. He described Taruk as one of the few men who impressed him in youth. He never talked to me of communism. He talked of the poor in this country. He opened my eyes to the inequities in my own hometown. I thought to myself, this is the first Christian I have met. The same year, age 21, he courted and married Corazon Cofanco a deeply religious, American-educated offspring of the largest landowners in Tarlac province. The president, Ramon Magsaysay, gave Aquino a medal and enlisted him as an advisor, aide and confidant. At President Magsaysay's urging, Aquino returned with Corazon to his family's house in Concepcion and ran for mayor. Bewildered by the ferocity of the opposition campaigns, Ninoy Aquino, for once in his life, thought of quitting. He was curled up in bed and said, I don't want to do this anymore. I just don't want to do this anymore. And my mom just, I think my mom had a terrific influence in him. and says, no, you've got to get up here and campaign. My mother, in trying to convince him to continue the, the fight, I think first applied her motherly authority. When that didn't work, she applied uh, feminine tears. When that didn't work, she applied pride that uh, even in cockfighting, you don't run away, you go down fighting. Ninoy found his voice knew exactly the pulse of the audience, when to crack a joke, when to touch their heart, when you draw an applause, because people just go to hear him. He can talk for, uh, not hours, for days, if given the chance. He called himself a radical rich guy, first as a mayor, then vice governor and governor of his province. He promoted land reform, equal access to public education, and social welfare. Charles Avila was then a young democratic socialist who had left the priesthood for a life of activism, inspired by the social vision of Pope John XXIII. When I first met him, he was rich, he was powerful, but he was a good man who was going to do I wanted to do good things for the people. It's a peaceful revolution, I think. That is what he was uh, looking for. Good things for the people. It's a peaceful revolution, I think. That is what he was uh, looking for. Because there's no victory in war. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was in prison and you visited me. I was a stranger and you took me in, etc. With what do you feed the hunger man, we would ask. Huh? With mere words or with rice? And how much does rice cost? <laughs> and uh, where are you getting the money? 
All the questions he asked me were oriented to what was the common good to the people. Of course, the cynic might say, he knew you were a seminarian. What did you expect? So be it. But that was the impression I got. Aquino had one hand in the province, one hand in the national capital. Almost daily, he traveled the 60 miles to Manila to serve President Mixaisai and his successors, Presidents Garcia and Macapagal, all of whom predicted that Aquino would in time be president. Their successor, Ferdinand Marcos, took a less kindly view. Marcos hated him, uh, as people used to say, because he saw himself in Ninoy. Marcos undercut Aquino's social programs in Tarlac and accused Aquino of being a communist or in league with communists. After four increasingly repressive years of the Marcos presidency, in 1967, Aquino ran nationwide for a seat in the Senate of the Philippines. And he won. His admirers in the press called him Superboy. Every one of us knew him because he had a long background in journalism. We knew he was bright, we knew he belonged to the right family, we know he talked fast, sharp, and being journalist, you said, I, we have to watch this guy. When Inoy was in the Senate, um, he uh, was uh, actively involved in a lot of government exposés. Uh, for irregularities and corruption and abuses that not only involved the president but even Imelda Marcus also at the time. And, and so uh, Ninoy poised himself as the only really serious threat to, to the presidency. It was almost an assumption that he would be president. He was the leader of his opposition party and um, it was an assumption that the way the party swung back and forth it would be his turn soon. Events intruded the United States, confidently relying on anti-communist methods developed by the CIA in the Philippines, escalated its war in Vietnam. Marcus promised his countrymen to stay out of the Vietnam War, but then made a deal with the U.S. President Lyndon Johnson. He sent Filipino soldiers to Vietnam in return for more arms more money. Students in the Philippines protested the war and also Marcus's corruption of the ballot box in what became known as the first quarter storm. Some joined Marxist rebels who regrouped in the countryside under the banner of the New People's Army. Poverty was rampant. Corruption abounded. I said to him, Ferdy, in as long as you're working for the country, you can count on me 100%. Mm -hmm. Mr. President, I said, you know, your salary is not enough to keep uh, a man in your position. I'll tell you what I'll do for you, I said. I will give you 20 million pesos a year, tax paid. And he said to me, how will you raise the money? Well, I said, you know, in the tobacco business, uh, we have to mix Virginia tobacco with local brands. I said, the manufacturers would happily pay me one peso or 150 a kilo of this tobacco. That is the money. I will pay the tax on it. I will pay the income on it. And then we'll turn over the money to you. No no strings attached. You don't have to do anything for us. He says, you know, that's a very good idea. Okay. Then he turned over the idea to his group of people. So they started bringing in the tobacco. They brought in sardines. They brought in apples. They brought in everything you could think of and levied on it and made money. So that maybe I was partially to blame. No? 
You'd think that the first billion dollars of siphoned off funds would be sufficient for any conceivable need or requirement he might have, personal or political. But uh, it was uh, like he kept it kept feeding on itself, and there seemed to be no limit to his avarice or to his willingness to permit his cronies to enrich themselves at the expense of the Filipino people. At one point, I coined the phrase kleptocracy to characterize the peculiar form of government that the Marcoses had, uh, had established. In the meantime, the Philippines, the, you know, the brightest star in Southeast Asia was slowly waning under this, I mean, economically waning, and the other countries were coming up, and that was in part a result of the corruption. In 1972, Mr. Marcos was already seven years in office. He had one year to go. He was toying with the idea of fielding Imelda, but Imelda showed very poor in the polls. So what did Mr. Marcos do? Change the Constitution. On the floor of the Senate, Ninoy charged that Marcus was transforming democratic society into a garrison state. He famously predicted that Marcus was planning to impose martial law to extend himself in power beyond the constitutional limit of eight years. The United States, with enormous influence over its one-time colony, by now in the person of President Richard M. Nixon, closed its eyes. And then, on September 23, midnight, Mr. Marcos went on television and said, I, Ferdinand Marcos, acting as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces of the Philippines, I now declare martial law and shall administer this country alone. On that day, democracy died. And the first to be arrested was Nino Aquino, of course, uh, while he was having a, a Senate hearing at Manila Hilton, I think. An army truck delivered all of his stuff, uh, clothes, uh, everything including and up to a toothbrush. And my mother said, why are you returning his toothbrush? And uh, the female soldier said, uh, he has no more need of it. Martial law is law of the gun. He who has the gun is the law. In jail, Aquino initially was surrounded by friends from the Liberal Party and independent-minded journalists. But one by one, his friends were let out or moved to new cells. Aquino was left to the one thing he seemed to fear, being alone. For seven years, I was not allowed to see the moon and the stars. I would walk and walk and walk across my room. There's a room of about four meters by five meters, hoping that I'll get tired. And then when I get tired, I will fall asleep, knowing that tomorrow will be the same. I felt that I already earned my peace. I have done my best. I waited for seven years and seven months, and the Filipino people did not react. And they would even give me the impression that they love their chain and their slavery. What can one man do if the Filipino people love their slavery? If the Filipino people have lost their voice and would not say no to a tyrant, what can one man do? I have no army, I have no following, I have no money. I only have my indomitable spirit. Aquino wrote attacks on martial law that were smuggled out, were smuggled out and published internationally the first public resistance to the abandonment of constitutional government. He was thrown into solitary confinement. The greatest punishment that was given to him was not being in jail, but because they took him away from people. He just loved people. He just, he, he glows when uh, he talks to anybody, to you or to me or to, to the guards. And, and so what happened when they put him in isolation and they would not allow visitors, I think that was when uh, it really hit him home. 
when I saw him in Fort Magsaysay, he had to hold on to uh, his pads, no? Because they li literally were falling off him. With the light bulb, they could light bulb shining the whole night, 24 hours. He didn't know it, what time it was. He didn't know if it's day or night. And he was there for days in that situation. So he had nothing but prayer. Within the timeless cave of Ninoy's cell, Jesus became a live human being. He berated Aquino for his self-pity. He told Aquino that with political success, he had become more and more like Marcos. In the depths of my desolation, he stood me face to face with myself and forced me to look at my emptiness and nothingness. And that Fort Pagsaysay, I think, was the, the turning point. From an ambitious politician to somebody committed to doing God's work for the people. No? I have read Mahatma Gandhi in prison. And this frail man, this man of almost 60 years old, barely 96 pounds, fought the entire British Empire and caused that empire to collapse. Why? Because he had an indomitable spirit. He had a moral spirit. And as long as man will refuse to be defeated, you are never defeated. Marcos tried anew to silence Aquino with trumped-up charges, a military tribunal, and the threat of death. His lawyers came often to defend him, but Aquino dismissed the tribunal as a farce. He refused to participate. He remained defiant, arguing, to a citizen of democracy, to protest is not only a right, it is a duty. Never did he show that his spirit was low. That is remarkable. At all times, he, he showed uh, the vibrancy of a leader. He was sentenced to death before a firing squad. He responded with a hunger strike. One of his priests told him that he was acting cowardly that it would be more courageous to live. On the 40th day, his body a shadow, Aquino relented. He battled back. He had been changed by his experiences and his soul had been changed and um, his mission was changed and his way of life was changed. The American Pat Darien was the human rights representative of the new American president, Jimmy Carter. Visiting Manila, she demanded that Marcos allow her to see Aquino. I said, could you just explain how it is that, that you have such bad human rights policies? And he said, well, it's really out of his hands. He said, pointing around to the table. I said, are these all government officials? He said, oh, well, no, no, they are Imelda's people. They, they are in charge of everything. They, they tell Imelda what they want. And Imelda tells them what she wants. And I said, well, you're the president. Why don't you do that? He said, they'll kill me. Late one night, she was abruptly taken from a dinner party to Fort Bonifacio Prison. I said, I don't want you to be punished in some way for this discussion that you didn't even know about. And he said, I'm, I, I will say anything I wish to say. There's nothing left that they can do. And he told about how the people were suffering how the Marcoses were stealing money. Everybody was expected to pay homage to them. He thought that Imelda was the one that really did the trick. He felt that he was too dangerous. 
that he was a rival. The imprisoned Aquino had become an international symbol of democratic opposition to dictatorship. Through Corey, he reached out to South Korea's Kim Dae-jung, who was imprisoned under similar circumstances. Dear Mrs. Kim Dae-jung, I share your sufferings. Please tell your husband that we, the Aquinos from the Philippines, think of him and remember him in our prayers. I pray that God will continue to help us and eventually guide us to better times. When the will of fortune finally turns in our favor, I look joyfully to meeting you and knowing you better. Sincerely, Cory Aquino. Under pressure from the U.S., Marcos attempted in 1978 to legitimize his rule by staging an election. Aquino was allowed to run from prison, reappearing briefly like a phantom on the public stage. At a highly controlled meeting with the press, Aquino was trim, fit, and well-groomed. After five years, Mr. Marcos says, I am going to call an interim batasan. This is an opportunity that we should not lose. For 45 days, at least we can campaign and hopefully elect some of our men to the IBP. The parliament, to be a real parliament, must need genuine opposition. Not a pseudo-opposition, not an opposition of the majority party, but a real, committed, genuine opposition. He threw constraint to the wind. We would like, Mr. Marcos, to allow the IBP to investigate the Westinghouse Decini deal. Why was Mr. Decini given not only commission as Perdis, commission as Asia Industries, and then on top of that, Mr. Decini was given exclusive subcontract for all the civil works, and on top of that, a very unknown insurance company of Mr. Decini got a whooping underwriting policy of $648 million for the entire project. Aquino was allowed out of prison only once for a television broadcast in which he famously defended himself from hostile questioners and continued his attack on martial law. Through intermediaries, he organized a slate of 21 candidates to run with him for Congress, mostly from Metro Manila. Lakas ng Bayan, Power of the People. That name Ninoy gave to the party that was challenging Marcos in the Metro Manila area. Lakas ng Bayan. They set up six rallies for the night. And the first one was in Paranaque that's a little outside north of Manila. And so we got there, the stage was set, the speakers were on, and when the candidates started to speak, there were exactly 12 people and six dogs. One of the candidates said, a whisper is louder than a shout. Whisper to your family, whisper to your friends, vote straight a whisper is louder than a shout. Whisper to your family. Whisper to your friends. Vote straight Laban. The trickle became a crowd. The crowd a throng. The symbol of resistance, the sign of the L, came into widespread use. It represents the word Laban which in uh, English means fight. When you do something like this, that means you're ready to fight for what you believe in. The night before the election, April the 6th, activated by the chain letter that passed underground from trusted friend to trusted friend, running through the night, the people of Manila produced a great barrage of noise. Alejandro Rosas, a Laban candidate, said noise was the first manifestation of people power. 
all those warm bodies populating the night unafraid, we discovered the peaceful uprising, the democratic insurgency that would later have the world admiring. The noise barrage laid bare Marcus's stuffing of the ballot box. When the dictatorship announced that Aquino had been defeated at the polls, election fraud was there for all to see. I thought um, the end is near for Marcos. I think um, I was thinking that whether they cheated us or not, we, we already had won the elections. The first incident that solidified the opposition was that Laban campaign of 1978. When we lost, then that incident that could have been a catalyst also fizzled out. Aquino paid tribute to a cellmate. In the eerie silence of my tomb, a little mouse appears, nervous, Afraid, retreats to a corner, watches me eat and pray, returning every night to keep me company. He shares my meager food, plays to amuse me, helping me waste the precious, priceless hours. How strange. I found friendship with a rodent I could not find among my captors, my countrymen. Aquilino Pimentel had run with Laban in Manila, then co-founded the Filipino Democratic Party, the PDP in the South. The PDP was, again, leftist, but non-communist, non-violent, and determined to develop a grassroots political culture to sustain real democratic government. In the Philippines, uh, political parties usually revolved around a strong man, a wealthy man, you know, around the personality of the founder rather than around ideas. But uh, when we founded PDP Laban, we used to require them at least a five-day seminar. One seminar would be in, uh, in Ilocos. We would have it under a mango tree. We would have around 20 to 40 participants. And I remember one once when we had it, and then a tank, two tanks came, pointed the cannons at us, and and so we want we we didn't know if we should continue. But then I did because I was the one facilitating. I said let's continue. So we just continued, and then the tanks went away. Although in and out of jail. Pimentel was elected mayor of the second largest city in Mindanao, Cagayan de Oro. A further indication that despite his repressions, Marcos was losing control. Underground networks organized themselves as urban guerrillas, striking high profile properties of Marcos and his cronies in Manila. The Light of Fire movement and the April 6th movement set out to destroy the impression that Marcus had everything under control, to destabilize his dictatorship, and to awaken the passive majority. I said, this is it. We have come to the point where we just have to make up our mind on what there is to be done, what is there for us to do. We need a realistic strategy to break the regime down. This combination of massive non-violence with incisive use of force. What I call myself is a hardcore nationalist. And at that time, I was willing to do anything to get Marcos out of there. Um, someone had come to my residence, someone I had known from my activist years in in the 70s, early 70s, and he asked me to um, if I could plant a bomb at the at the convention where Marcus was speaking, and I was very hesitant at first. 
because I knew that it was a gem of an opportunity for propaganda and we did want to bring the dictatorship to its knees and I did realize too that this was a prime occasion for getting world attention you know to what Marcos was doing here I just said um, just make it a small bomb <laughs> The United States was enmeshed in a contradiction so extreme that it went all but unmentioned. The United States government was propping up Marcos with military and monetary aid, while the cities of the U.S. harbored and sometimes nurtured the opposition to Marcos among Filipino Americans and Filipino exiles. A prominent liberal, Raul Manglapas, had been traveling when martial law was declared. He became president of a new organization in the U.S., the Movement for a Free Philippines. Sonny Alvarez had gone underground in Manila the day martial law was declared. So I jumped out of bed and started to look for refuge. I'd work around in disguise and I moved around. And uh, sometimes I find myself, uh, myself in one community, deliver a fast speech and go. And then uh, one time, uh, President Macapagal, who had become the president of the Constitutional Convention, uh, he said that uh, there's need to have an organized opposition overseas. So he turned to me and said about you, Sony. He called me Sony. <laughs> Uh, uh, you're a bachelor, you're young. So I said, uh, yes, why not? Uh, I would. Uh. A Greek-American businessman, Steve Zanakis, and his aristocratic Filipino wife, Pressy Lopez Zanakis, settled in San Francisco. Marcos had taken Pressy's brother hostage and then plundered the Lopez family's enormous assets. They devoted themselves without reservation to bringing down Marcos. And the, the, the decision to devote all my time to try to help the people of the Philippines to, to get him out, I felt that you have to fight for, 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 for what's right, not for what are, the, what are the percentages of success. It's easy to to decide on what you do every day. You don't say first, let me see if, if uh, this will affect my family or will hurt my children or will take my property. You do it because you have to do it. And then the odds change because you don't calculate the odds. Opponents of Marcos within the U.S. were spied upon, threatened, and sometimes terrorized. I read in the papers uh, that uh, my brother was killed. I was, I was warned first, I was warned. They gouge his eyes, they bust his head, uh, they, they gouge his eyes, they bust his head, uh, they uh, cut his tongue and uh, broke his teeth. He was so mangled, uh, it, it was really, I think deliberately intended to drive home a message that if you oppose the regime, uh, there could be these terrible consequences. They call the system selective terror. Marcos was a very, very brilliant man. He knew he could not follow a thousand people all over the United States to see what they're doing, but he would do selectively, he would do something which would be deliberately disclosed, so everybody would be terrified. Everybody thought that Marcos had three agents following every person here. Although President Carter tried to put a new priority to human rights, his administration wavered in the face of pressure to negotiate with Marcos. At stake was the continued use of American military bases in the Philippines, Clark Air Force Base, and Subic Bay Submarine Base, the two largest overseas military bases in the world. In this complex swirl of pressure and counter-pressure, Marcos thought it imprudent to execute Aquino. 
but also feared letting him loose. Aquino suffered a heart attack. When he refused to be treated by Marcus's doctors, he was hurriedly removed from prison and put on a flight to the United States. It was 1980. When Ninoy came here, Marcos let him leave the country for an emergency heart bypass operation. And they're, they're all very happy. Uh, Nino is out of prison. They're a family again. The kids are going to school. He taught some classes and he did research. And his research was basically trying to restore democracies in countries around the world through peaceful means. Aquino became a fellow at Harvard's Center for International Studies. He spoke on 50 college campuses, addressed the Council on Foreign Relations, and testified before the United States Congress. Through Harvard, he and Corey formed a personal friendship with South Korea's Kim Dae-jung, who, like Aquino, had been driven into exile by authoritarian government. From the moment uh, when we met, we felt that we are the comrades to fight for the democratization of our countries against dictatorships. We felt we were sharing the same destinies, so we were doomed to uh, collaborate each other for the democratization. Aquino communicated incessantly with followers and colleagues in the Philippines and within the United States. In the name of the members of the movement for a free Philippines and all other freedom fighters, I welcome you. Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes the life of a nation is inextricably linked with the life of a person. The destiny of the nation and the fate of the person by some chance of fate become one. I received a most poignant letter from a mother and a wife and I'd like to read it to you. My dear Senator Aquino. I am very worried about my husband and wish to see him immediately. It has been two months since his arrest and still I have not spoken to him. Our son keeps on asking me when he shall see his tatay. He asks me questions like, Bakit nakakulong si tatay? And why don't we go and set tatay free? I am writing you now because I have just received word from my husband that he intends to go on a hunger strike starting Wednesday, February 4. I understand that a number of other detainees accused of their involvement with the April 6 movement will also go on a hunger strike beginning February 4. Please pray for them. Thank you in advance for any help you can give me. Please, sir, help me see my husband at the soonest time possible. And may the Lord continue blessing you with compassion and courage. Sincerely, Christina Montiel. How many Montiels are there? How many unsung, unnamed Filipinos are still languishing in the jails of our land? In that blighted land of ours where our founding fathers gave up their lives that we may see the morning sun. The most important division within the anti-Marcus forces was between the philosophies of violence and non-violence. But there's the notion that things can be accomplished by violence. Trying to shake that notion is really hard. Nonviolent action is a lot less easy to transmit in terms of its amazing power. People whose name I cannot now tell you because their lives are in danger. They told me, Mr. Senator, they said, we have waited eight years for you. Lead us. We are now ready. Maybe we are a handful. But we are now ready to lay down our lives, and these are young Filipino boys and girls. I told them, if you go into the road of violence, it will only lead to more violence, I said. And what will happen when 10,000 boys and girls are already dead in the streets of Manila, and blood will be, will be flowing in our very streets? I cannot, I said, resist the wailing of mothers who will now blame me. 
that their children have died in the altar of freedom. Aquino engaged in the pro and con, but stood fast in his commitment to nonviolence, reinforced by an epic film about Gandhi. Ninoy saw that movie so many times. And this idea of soul force, of the power of the truth, of the power to say no. Huh? And the, uh, the power to contaminate soul to soul, people with your courage, huh? with your passion, because you love, because you tell the truth, because you are ready to lay down your life. This was uh, Nino now saying, remember, it is massive non-violence. It is the, it's the power of the people. The people are not violent. There were rumors that Marcos was very ill, that he had kidney problems, that he might be having a kidney transplant, and as a result might die. At that time, the economy was bad. Uh, the communist insurgency had grown tenfold in the previous five or six years or whatever. So he wanted to go home while Marcos was still alive and try to convince him to restore the processes of democracy. They had uncovered a plot to assassinate him when he got off the plane in Manila. And so I called Ninoy and I said, Ninoy, I have to report this to you. Um, and he was, he was very quiet after I told him what I had heard. And he said, I have to do this. This is my mission. This is what uh, God has ordained for me to do. And I have to relieve the Philippine people of their suffering. Well, Lopita and I met him in, uh, in San Francisco. He led me to the window and said, you see that airplane that I came in on? I said, yes. He said, you see that, that ladder going down the plane? I said, yes. And he said to me, they may lead me down that ladder when I come to the Philippines. And if they do, you'll never see me again. Inside the plane was quite tense as we taxied into the terminal. Um, and I looked out the window and I could see the military men coming up the stairs of the jetway into the plane. They, they, they helped him get up from the seat and they were going out so I yelled at him. I said, no, I'm going with you. And he turned around and he said, yeah, come on. I think those were his last words. Aquino had often quoted St. Paul, for the sake of Christ, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. The journalist, Louis Beltran, wrote of Ninoy's swift rising and walking toward the fatal steps, his determination to confront whatever and whoever it was. That picture of Ninoy is forever frozen in the mind, and men still scream soundlessly over the murder of their innocence. Aquino had been out of the public eye for most of 11 years, and news of his death was reduced to 10 seconds on Philippine television. But when his mother arose long before dawn of the next day, she found an endless stream of people paying their respects. <laughs> The energy unleashed by his assassination was immediate and massive. 
Corey said, when Nino was killed, people thought, that's it, that's the end. Then I saw the sacrifice of Nino had awakened the spirit of all those multitudes. I have seen with my eyes what Ninoy saw with faith, that the Filipino is worth dying for. I call upon everybody to get involved, to know the truth. As long as we are united, there is no power on earth that can change the will of the people. They can try, but we will crush them if we are united as a people. Somebody said, we have to move the body to the church because we cannot accommodate everybody who wants to view Ninoy. While this time we were, uh, we expected again, we, maybe 50,000 people will show up. Well, much more than that. If not a million, two million. That's the first time I realized we have underestimated our own people. Coria was walking right behind the hearse. As we were walking, she motioned for me to come up and she said, I will accept condolences from Marcos only if he releases all political prisoners. Until that point, we didn't know whether she was going to get involved in carrying on Ninoy's work and legacy. The new energy of the Philippines people was disciplined by the philosophy of nonviolence that Ninoy Aquino had bequeathed to his country. Protest demonstrations went on and on, week after week, month after month, and the authority of Marcos was diminished, marching foot by marching foot. The final act was the Philippine uprising of 1986, which the world watched. Corazon Aquino, the person who had been Ninoy's helpmate, a server of coffee, a reluctant campaigner, running as a United Front opposition candidate, found her voice. She became President of the Republic of the Philippines. Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos were driven into exile in the United States. In the furor unleashed by the assassination of Benigno Ninoy Aquino, an astonishing development in world history was overlooked. Where Gandhi had used nonviolence to throw out the colonizer, and where Dr. Martin Luther King had used nonviolence to expand civil rights, Aquino had reworked nonviolence as a means of national revolution to drive out the dictator and restore democracy. It was a great turning point in the world history because up until his death, the Western world thought some degrees of authoritarian military rule was inevitable in Asian countries. However, after the death of Central Aquino, even Western world started to realize that if they do not build democracy in Asian countries, people of all those countries may not endure the kind of dictatorships. The Philippine Revolution became a model for all of the revolutions that occurred at the end of the Cold War, as well as in other places throughout Latin America and a number of other places in the world. The East Germans, of course, uh, had access to Western television, um, as did, I think, the Czechs and the Hungarians, so they, they all had been treated for the last two or three years to pictures of dictatorships being toppled by peaceful mass demonstrations. I've been privileged to travel to many different countries around the world. 
And I can tell you that wherever I've been, from South Korea to South Africa, from Poland to Pakistan, the triumph of people's power in the Philippines has been a source of enduring inspiration to millions of men and women who yearn for democracy in their own countries. I left America in grief to bury my husband, Ninoy Aquino. Today, I have returned as the president of a free people. The dictator already knew that Ninoy was not a body merely to be imprisoned, but a spirit he must break. For even as the dictatorship demolished one by one the institutions of democracy, the press, the Congress, the independence of the judiciary, the protection of the Bill of Rights, Ninoy kept their spirit alive in himself. For the nation, Ninoy became the pleasing sacrifice that answered their prayers for freedom. So in giving we receive, in losing we find, and out of defeat we snatched our victory. Sad luck, sad. 